Recording live from FYP Studios East and West and West, Wester. Yeah, transmitting across the internet. This is episode 299 of Registry Matters. Good evening, gentlemen. How are you? Good, good. I'm, Larry? I'm, I'm doing awesome because it is warm, beautiful, coming on late spring, and we're soon going to be into summertime. And then you'll be sending me screenshots of 105 and 100 degree temperature, 110, right? Well, that was last year because the air conditioning was broken, but this year it's brand new, so hopefully we won't have that problem. Yeah, but I mean, it's still going to be 110 outside. Oh, I can handle it. Oh, okay. I bet. I bet you run in, in a Larry-style run from your car with AC to the building with AC. I can handle it oh. 120. I've been to Phoenix before. Oh, that's right. Your building was out, wasn't it? Last year, yes, for about a for month. For like two or three. <laughs> and <laughs> I do remember that now. Chance, do you? Is it scorching hot in the summertime there? Nah, nah. You know, maybe, uh, maybe a very small time during the summer. Most of the time, it's just beautiful. Just beautiful. All right. Um, well, everyone, please make sure that you subscribe on your favorite podcast app, like and subscribe and thumbs up and all those things on YouTube. And it helps out the algorithm, helps us out, helps people find the content if they are new because new people still show up and they're like, what's FYP mean? And all that. So anyway, and then if you are feeling generous, please become a patron. And that would also be fantastic. And then you can get a part and join in on Discord where Deputy is posting AI tracks of me and Larry singing, which is quite amusing. But what are we going to be doing tonight, Larry? Well, we got this great episode planned. Actually, I think you're going to love it. We're planning to discuss <laughs> a case I'm working on here in New Mexico that involves some of your favorite topics. Such as? Well, we're going to be doing interstate compact for Delta offender supervision, PFR probation supervision, and PFR polygraph testing. Ah, PFR polygraph. The kabuki machine as it is, eh? Yep, and we have a listener, a couple of listener questions about the interstate compact, which, which ties in nicely. And there are a few articles if time permits. Yeah, you're going to tell the audience about this. Um, uh, you were you played hooky last week, so tell the audience about this. I did. So I, I, you know, I had planned on going to down in Arkansas, and it was going to be a massively long drive, but the weather was just going to be miserable, so I, I bailed on that one and went all the way up almost to where you could see the Canadian border and up in, uh, what's it called? It's called Plattsburgh, New York. And went and saw the eclipse. And it was just fabulous because it was like three and a half minutes, 340, I think is what it turned out to be of the eclipse. And had the glasses, had cameras, and it's cold as crap. Oh, my God, is it cold, even in April in Plattsburgh, New York. It was amazing, though. It was really awesome. Now, that far north, were you able to see a hovercraft on the horizon? <laughs> <laughs> there was no hovercraft. You know, there were a bunch of drones, though. I think people were filming the uh, as the shadow streaks across the ground with the, their drones. So, well, I understand you've got some pictures posted already. Uh, I have posted some somewhere, but other, you know, Larry, if, if with your cell phone, you can take some really nice pictures of it. But people with ten thousand dollars of gear, with all the magnifiers, so they can get a really big fat picture with seeing all the little crests and and the mountains and stuff and the and the, they're called bailey's beads there you can't do that without having a massive amount of gear and uh, so otherwise just enjoy the experiment the experience it's not really it's you'll, you'll end up missing the experience messing with all the gear so well all right well i'm glad you're back i am back well here's a question that came in this one's larry i don't think we've ever covered puerto rico because you know it's another country, right? Not exactly. You, there was this funny story. There was a hurricane that happened 2018, maybe, and rolled right over. And I heard people on the news, boy, I am so glad that this hurricane missed the United States. Meanwhile, Puerto Rico got destroyed. But anywho, I digress. The 
uh, questioner says, I was transferred from Virginia to Puerto Rico under an interstate compact without being required to continue a treatment program that Virginia had originally sentenced me to. My probation officer indicated that participation in the program might not be necessary after the move. After serving three years of trouble-free probation, Virginia is now refusing to grant me early release because I didn't complete their mandated program, despite Puerto Rico being satisfied with my conduct and ready to terminate my probation. Given this situation, is there a risk that Virginia might attempt to incarcerate me due to this issue? What steps can I take to successfully conclude my probation and leave Puerto Rico? Now, you did a little editing job there. He, said, he actually said something a little bit stronger. <laughs> I, I to, did. Mm, I, I ran mm. it through something to, to clean it up a tad. Yeah, well, I cleaned it up quite a bit, but he wants to leave the United States. Oh, uh, I see. Yeah, so, um, but anyway, uh, Chance, I'll go first, and then you can fill in the gaps. So, okay. transferred under the Interstate Compact, remember all the conditions that are imposed in the jurisdiction of conviction follow you. So that means completion of a treatment program would be required. Now we're looking in the rearview mirror at this point. It would have been ideal had he been able to get Virginia to certify that he'd completed treatment. But since he did not or could not do that, then we're in a conundrum because now he would like early termination and the PO in Virginia that's got this case is on non-Virginia supervision, but it's still on someone's desk to be monitored for Virginia. They may have nothing to, no knowledge what happened uh, three years ago, may not be the same person, maybe an interstate compact unit. So they're looking at this and saying, hmm, conditions say he needs to complete a treatment program. That's not been submitted to us, so therefore he's not in full compliance. But it gets a little dicier because, as I understand it, in most jurisdictions, if there's not a violation alleged during the term of the probation, the term of the probation generally expires, and they can't file a petition to revoke except in limited circumstances after the term has expired, and Chance can probably dig into some of those limitations of the circumstances. One is generally if you haven't paid your, your fines and your fees, well, they won't really know until the final day that you haven't paid everything. So I think that's generally an exception. But on this, if Virginia hasn't sought to, uh, to violate him, nor has Puerto Rico sought to violate him, my expectation would be that he would be terminated at the end of the term. But he wants to be terminated early. He wants that privilege of being released early. And I do not know how to achieve that unless he can recreate what happened in Virginia and convince them that he did de facto complete their obligation that they imposed for him to go through an approved treatment program to its completion. So Chance, what, what say you? Well, I, I say this. Um... When you're asking for a favor, and early termination is a favor, and it's contingent on the originating state, you do what you can to comply with those conditions so that there's no issue at the time you ask for the early termination. Otherwise, you're at the mercy of that state's conditions, and you're right. If no one takes exception, when it expires, it expires. But uh, if you're going to ask a favor, you're going to need to make sure you cover all your bases. Well, do you see any reasonable way he would be able to go back to Virginia and say, look, I was in this treatment program for X number of sessions or X number of years, and I didn't have an official termination, but I had de facto completed that. To me, that's his only option, because if Puerto Rico hasn't had a program and didn't put him in one, they don't have anything to offer at all to, to Virginia in terms of satisfying that condition other than we, we wouldn't have imposed it but it's not their choice whether they would have imposed it their job is to enforce it that's right that's right and 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 i guess that that would be plan a right there um whether or not that that's going to work out who knows but you also um could get into some stickiness uh and uh you know where where Everything's going good up until expiration. All of a sudden, you want early termination. You go back, and 
they insist that when the conditions aren't complied with, that can grow into something worse than what is now, which is, you know, a path to successful exploration. It's, this is, this is the, these are the, the problems that are laden with, you know, when you, when you decide that you, you know, want to early terminate and you've done everything you're supposed to do, but you have one of these situations, it's, it's sticky. I can, I can see the potential for that. I mean, it's one of those things when you open a record, sometimes the scrutiny will reveal something you don't want them to be, uh, have re revealed. So he asked for early termination and Virginia says, oh, well, you're out of compliance. We're going to send a retaking notice to Puerto Rico. Now, wouldn't that be funny? Yep. That Well, it would in a way and it wouldn't another way. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So... Now, so to, he his charges and all that happened in Virginia, and then he has moved to Puerto Rico, and he's lived there, trouble-free, all that stuff, and he's trying to get early release. Virginia says he needs to complete treatment, and they're not requiring treatment in Puerto Rico. Who's in charge? Virginia. So he has to comply with whatever Virginia says. If they want treatment, he's got to go find someone in Puerto Rico to do the treatment well it's as i said so many times your conditions follow you wouldn't it be a great country if you could be put on under a penalty and go to another state and escape the punishment i mean everybody would there'd be so many people moving you wouldn't believe it but uh this system appears to have broken down in the original transfer request because the way it's supposed to work is that the receiving jurisdiction, if they cannot enforce a condition, they're supposed to notify the sending state, we're unable to enforce this condition. And the sending state can make the determination whether they want to lift or modify that condition or just say, no, the transfer doesn't go through. In this case, the transfer went through. Now, whether that gives him any standing, and I would have to do more research to figure out if an unenforced condition that the receiving state didn't catch on to until years into the supervision, if there's any allowance for that error to to inure to his benefit, I don't know the answer to that. That's interesting. That's that's the stickiness of it all. Man, all right. And and Larry, out of curiosity, since Puerto Rico is not a state, is interstate compact transferring to a United States territory? Is it very similar to transferring to another state? Uh, at my initial research, it's one of the territories and it's one of the compacting parties. So yes, it's okay. the same as a state. Interesting. And you don't need a passport to go to Puerto Rico, I don't believe? I can't imagine that you would need a passport as an American to go to an American territory. Just checking. Correct. Because again, there was the whole thing with, I'm so glad the hurricane missed the United States. Meanwhile, I mean, like they got wrecked. People were like starving to death and whatnot. And the former president was down there throwing out paper towels. Well, he, he, was, also, he was also handing out uh, uh, relief aid. Remember, they, he said, oh, it's, this is blowing a hole in our deficit, but that's all right. <laughs> he was throwing paper towels, as I recall. Oh, my God, Will has shown up. Oh, my God, Will hasn't been here in a million years. Whoa, sorry. Do you want to say hi, Will, Larry, in your southern draw? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then we have another question. I wanted to update you on a recent development in Wisconsin. Our governor has signed SB 874 into law, which redefines the criteria for being labeled a repeat offender based on actions occurring on two or more separate occasions. This law is retroactively applied only as far back as September 2, 2017. I was convicted in 2000 of multiple counts of CP and was removed from the registry on September 7th of 2023. Congratulations on that, which was 15 years after my probated con uh, probation concluded. However, last Wednesday, I was informed that due to this new legislation, I would be reinstated on the registry. Ugh. It's disheartening that after 24 years, I am faced with this situation because the law now categorizes anyone with multiple counts as a repeat offender. Thank you. That's from Chris. Yikes. Isn't that what we all fear, though, is that somewhere they change the law and it draws us all back in? That is certainly a possibility to be cognizant of. And when people 
spend so many hours worrying about imaginary boogeyman. This boogeyman is not imaginary. This is one thing that you actually should worry about is what's going on in the legislative arena because as long as it's a civil regulatory scheme, they have been known in states to welcome people back to the registry who have been terminated from the registry. So in terms of this question, it's got a nuance to it that I think that's going to be answered by Adele Nicholas and Mark Weinberg in some ongoing litigation that they have about GPS monitoring and uh, the constitutionality of lifetime GPS monitoring. But what I would tell people is they hung their hats on a Supreme Court ruling out of the Wisconsin Supreme Court that interpreted what the legislature meant when they said two or more separate occasions. And they looked at what they thought a reasonable interpretation of that was, and they interpreted it that way and said it has to be criminality and that arises on separate occasions and separate cases. Well, it's the legislature's prerogative to go back and say, no, that is not what we meant. We meant this. And they have actually ratified by legislative action what the uh, attorney general do you remember the opinion letter that was so controversial that uh, the Wisconsin Attorney General had issued an opinion of what two or separate, more, two or more separate occasions meant? You remember that? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is the so legislatively they have clarified it is their prerogative as a legislative branch to do that. If the judiciary says we think it meant this, and they say no, we actually meant this, that is their prerogative to do that. That doesn't mean that more constitutional challenges can't ensue because just because they meant that doesn't make it constitutional that you can search and seize someone's location data for the rest of their life. But as far as there's nothing inherently wrong with what the Wisconsin legislature did and the governor signed it, which is, remember I predicted that the governor would sign it, there'd be actually, actually no reason in the world the governor would have vetoed that because he would have thought there was a rare opportunity for a bipartisan bill to have passed. It was probably near, near unanimous, if not completely unanimous. And the governor would have looked at that and said, in an election year with half of my assembly up for a re-election, I am not going to ask them to stand with me on a veto of something that's going to only lose uh, uh, the Democratic seats. And so, so there was no way in the world he was going to veto that. So, all right, well, I'll quit pontificating, Chance. What do you think? I, I just think it's horrific. <laughs> We, you know, just horrific. Uh, that's the only way I can describe it. One person in chat said, once off, it should be permanent. My reply, Larry, is it's a civil regulatory scheme. It's not punishment. And I got voted thumbs down. What do you mean I got voted thumbs down? Somebody gave me a thumbs down emoji instead of a thumbs up. So... Well, it is a civil regulatory scheme until it's defined as otherwise by the courts. And right now, it's a civil regulatory scheme. But we're going to get into some articles, if time permits. We're going to be talking about elections have consequences, and they do have consequences. And people wanted the legislators that they have in Wisconsin, and this is what they did to them. And is, is this going to be one of those cases where elections have consequences, Larry? Well, this is definitely a consequence of an election. If there had been a strong Democratic majority, there, this may not have passed. Who knows? But under the current makeup, the Wisconsin legislature is under firm Repu Republican control, although they happen to have a Democratic governor. But the Democratic governor was not going to get into a veto fight over this, not something that's only going to lose votes. He just wouldn't do that. Moving along then? Let's do it. All right. Well, before we do uh, jump into the deep end, Larry, you've had a rather peculiar brush with a constituent through your senatorial gig in New Mexico. Could you tuck us on uh, this little tale for us? Uh, yeah, after I'd worked many hours on her problem, we discovered that she doesn't even live in the district. Also, I got snookered by her. Wait, I'm sorry, say that second part again? Uh, I got snookered by her. You got snookered? <laughs> Expand on that, please. How did you get snookered exactly? <laughs> now, that's not funny. Why the heck did you play the laugh track? 
Uh, because you always find everything else funny, and this was our opportunity to poke fun at you. <laughs> if you say so. You got a weird sense of humor. That's me. Well, Funny not funny is what it always is, Larry. So, well, she's certifiable for one thing. And the next thing is she's very unstable, and she has now made sexual misconduct allegation against the owner of the building. Yikes. Um, and so what's the underlying problem then? Well, she lost her husband of two months after. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not funny, but <laughs> God, I mean, like the, the ring hasn't even settled into and made a crease on your finger yet. And so they were married two months and she can't pay the rent. And I felt bad for her. The senator felt bad for her because the ownership is being very aggressive about wanting their money. And they're threatening her with an eviction, and she's 70 years old. And I thought, well, gee, may give her a chance to get her affairs in order. And she's going to be getting a Social Security benefit as a as a, a widow of a, of a worker. She's going to be getting it. She's already received her first payment. So my compassion blinded me from seeing everything that I should have seen. Did so wait so literally she was only married to this individual for two months yes and the funny thing is that this is her second husband that has died under mysterious circumstances <laughs> wow. Larry I, I gotta interject does snookering trigger a registration requirement <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist so yes uh, well there's a story of a very high profile case here those who are bored, you can Google it. Uh, uh, Commissioner Eugene Gilbert, and he was married to a woman whose name escapes me, but he died a very mysterious death uh, to this woman. Uh, uh, it, he was uh, they had broken up, and he was coming back to the house to get together, and she heard a strange sound downstairs, and she thought uh, Commissioner Gilbert was an intruder. And she shot him to death. That was like maybe 20, 25 years ago. But prior to that, in, in, the, in the 70s, she was married to a guy, I think his name was Corey Hotchkiss. And they broke up and Mr. Hotchkiss was coming back for late night rendezvous. And she thought that there was an intruder. <laughs> and she shot Mr. Hotchkiss the same way she shot Commissioner Gilbert. She got acquitted on both of them. Now, can you at least admit that that's fine? That's probably funny. <laughs> uh, so it's we, close we to We really funny. should we should leave this one alone and move on to the next topic. You <laughs> actually want to talk about a case you are working on in New Mexico, not as a lawyer. I want to emphasize not in a legal, not as a lawyer capacity, not as Esquire. It involves one of our favorite topics. It does indeed. It's the interstate compact and other favorite topics, PFR supervision and polygraph testing, which you love dearly. Polygraph testing is nothing at all but junk science. The reason why I refer to it as the kabuki machine. Didn't the 10th Circuit agree with me? Uh, no, they did not totally agree with you. They, they did issue a ruling about the kabuki machine in terms of self-incrimination. Refresh our audience on that, please. And May 2016, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit held that PFRs released from custody cannot be compelled to answer potentially incriminating polygraph questions as a condition of federal supervised relief. Release. The ruling came after an early emergency stay of a polygraph test was issued by the appellate court. The case centered on Brian Von Bering, a Colorado resident who was convicted of distribution of CP in 2005 and sentenced to 121 months in federal prison. I hear that, that 10 years for possession, mm -hmm. along with a three-year term of supervised release. And in March 2014, as Von Bering's prison sentence was ending, a special condition of his supervised release was modified, requiring him to submit to a sexual history polygraph that included potentially incriminating questions. He challenged and won. In fact, he attended one of our NARSO conferences. Didn't we have him on as a, as a guest? I believe at, we did. I at, was just going to ask. I thought we did. At, at that conference, I think we did. I don't think it was at that conference. I don't, mm, maybe. I'll have to go look. I know. I remember talking to him, though. And uh, it, it, that's a fascinating story. Larry, you said he was convicted of possession. He was convicted of distribution. 
Oh, well, that was, that makes some difference. It does. I believe that just just holding on to versus uh, pushing it out, that's a whole different conversation. Now, um, now, everybody in the federal system gets convicted of distribution because there's something about the file sharing that they do totally. that, that's been uh, interpreted to be distribution, but I don't understand Absolutely. All that. Oh, it's yeah, it, 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 I can see that it would be. All right. Anyway, let's shift gears and spill the beans on the high stakes case involving the former cop. It's a high profile case involving a former police officer. And he's he's uh, been in negotiations with the plea, which may result in a probated sentence or a short period of incarceration followed by probation. Uh, as I understand it, he's now living in the freedom-loving state of Texas. Larry, why don't these people move to the communist state of uh, Colorado instead of? And he wants to have his supervision transferred there. Correct. He's actually already departed this leftist state of New Mexico and established residence in the freedom-loving state of Texas where virtually nobody gets removed from the registry. <laughs> I'm sorry, because we talked about that just two weeks ago, three weeks ago, the communist state of Colorado. Um, what are his concerns that brought you into the case? Well, the attorney brought me in, and, and Chance Mike can explain that when, when I'm actually working under the supervision of an attorney, then the privileges at attach, and I can give advice because she is actually, this is an uh, attorney, she's liable for any, any advice that I give that's not correct, but... I can tell him that as my opinion, and your lawyer has sought my opinion, I believe this is uh, what you should do. But Chance, do you do you agree or disagree on that? Uh, yeah, you certainly can advise, but you can you can advise the client, but you can certainly explain to the attorney what your opinion is and what you think. So, well, the first issue is the effectuation of the transfer from New Mexico. He's been told that he'll have to be supervised here for up to forty five days before he can be transferred to Texas. The second issue is how he would handle the sexual history polygraph initial tests, which they would, which would likely be administered here in New Mexico if he ends up being supervised here for those forty-five days. You you say if he ends up being supervised in New Mexico, is there a possibility that he would not need to be supervised there initially? In my opinion, there's a very strong possibility that he would uh, that he would not. Uh, because if New Mexico were to be following the terms of the interstate compact, he wouldn't need to be spending that 45 days here. You seem to forget that FYP has vast archives, Larry, and I recall that you have pontificated repeatedly over the years that there's a special rule for how they handle transfers of PFRs. They need pre-approval before they can go. Well, you're correct. Uh, uh, when did you have time to search our archives? I actually know that firsthand. I, I, there are some conditions where you are like guaranteed to go, but otherwise, when I tried to transfer, I had to have an address, a job. I had to do all that stuff before they would even consider it. So I have indeed stated and pontificated that. The problem for them is if the court accepts the plea that he's negotiated, he will not be a sex offender as defined by the interstate compact. How's that? Well, he's pleading to one count of contributing to delinquency of a minor. And under the compact, one must be defined as a sex offender either by the ascending state or by the receiving state. Neither New Mexico nor Texas defines that offense as a sexual offense. So he's not actually a PFR. He's a standard supervision offender. Now, I'll go off script here a little bit. If he were to stay in this state, he would be supervised as a PFR. He would not have to register, but they would put the whole gamut of sex offender special conditions on him, uh, polygraph, all that stuff, because they look at the underlying. They reach beyond what the actual plea is, so they say, well, you did this because these are the underlying facts. But, but he's not officially defined as a sex offender under the compact, so therefore he's eligible for an expedited transfer. Uh, there's, there's a special rule that governs the transfer of PFRs. Now, now wait a minute. I gotta, I gotta inject here. So, isn't that the executive branch chance? Isn't that the executive branch doing judge, uh, the judicial branch work of saying that these are the underlying conditions and you will be treated this way? Uh, no, not necessarily. It, it's certainly a delegation of powers. But you know, if if the delegate has the powers to make the call, that's the call. It has to say so somewhere. It's got to be some kind of law legislation somewhere that says that. I don't like your answer. 
I know it's horrific. <laughs> it's horrific, but that's the area. <sighs> that's the niche we have to, you know, we, we have to concentrate on. Are you a first time listener of registry matters? Well then make us a part of your daily routine and subscribe today. Just search for registry matters through your favorite podcast app. Hit the subscribe button and you're off to the races. You can now enjoy hours of sarcasm and snark from Andy and Larry on a weekly basis. Oh, and there's some excellent information thrown in there too. Subscribing also encourages others of you people to get on the bandwagon and become regular Registry Matters listeners. So what are you waiting for? Subscribe to Registry Matters right now. Help us keep fighting and continue to say F Y. Well, then what are the special rules, Larry, for the PFR transfers? Well, it's under the Interstate Compact for Delta Thunder Supervision rules, and it's 3.103-3. And the, the general rule is 3.103-1. And we have it below. A PFR cannot be granted reporting instructions until the receiving state has approved the address. It doesn't matter that the person was already living there at the time of the conviction. And I spend a lot of time with attorneys because they think that they can send someone back home after they've done their plea here in New Mexico because we have border border cities where you may have gotten in trouble in an internet sting or something and they think they can plead them out. Nope, nope, can't do that. What do you mean can't do that? Well, your person, once they plead to a sexual offense, they're stuck here until they're approved to go back. Well, but Larry, he, he's been living there for 26 years. It doesn't matter. That may be an exclusion zone in that state. So you can't dump a PFR into an exclusionary zone per the compact. So that's the reason why they have that special rule. Well, let's assume he achieves his goal of of moving to the freedom-loving state of Texas. Which state's probation rules would be in control? Because this really always makes my head spin. Well, New Mexico has complete control over the duration and any early termination from that sentence. In terms of the supervision itself, both states control. He must abide by the conditions New Mexico imposed, plus any special conditions that Texas may choose to impose. And Texas can impose any, like anything that they want to? Uh, no, not anything they want to, but they can impose special conditions as long as those conditions are what they routinely impose on those convicted of similar offenses in Texas. And that is somewhat logical because you've got a probation officer with 60, 70, 80 probationers and them running around with a flow chart of how they supervise offenders. And when they go into a team visit with a probationer, they, they can't be all that differentiation. So they tell you that your conditions how we supervise PFRs here, we're going to put those on you even if New Mexico did not. And you're obligated to follow those. When you sign your application to be transferred, you agree to follow those special conditions imposed by the receiving state. And you can always tell them to take those special conditions and do something with them. (laughs) Take this job and shove it, as it were? You can do that, but they won't transfer you you if you decline to sign that. Um, can he be revoked for violating a Texas imposed condition? Yes, he certainly can. Now we, we can certainly ask somebody in chat about that one too. He, he got, he transferred over to Texas and got completely wrecked. Yes. Uh, you can, oh, but he had a Georgia probation. He transferred over to Texas, but, uh, but you can, you can definitely, uh, the receiving state can, uh, they can't do the revocation themselves. But there's a process by which they can facilitate that. And if the sending state doesn't want to revoke you, it's actually referred to as a retaking. They can force the sending state to retake you, but they'll no longer supervise you. But ultimately, the revocation is likely to be a good possibility. If you've so, uh, if you violated so significantly that the receiving state is trying to get rid of you, a judge in the sending state it's going to look very favorably upon that if they've documented their stuff. Uh, so you very well can find yourself sitting in prison. Would you do me a favor? Would you like take a quick little lap around the difference between the retaking and the, uh, I, you know, I, the opposite, I think the other words, ex- extraditing? Extradition. Yes, there there is a lot of confusion, even by legal professionals that have that fancy degree. A retaking mm-hmm. is not the same thing as an extradition. And although 
people treat it that same way. So a person gets thrown into custody on interstate compact and they're sitting in jail and the machinations are not moving because it's up to the sending state to figure out what to do. So they're sitting and sitting and sitting and the public defender walks in and they say, well, you know, if you'll just sign this waiver of extradition, we can get you on back down to Georgia and they can take care of all this stuff there. Well, the problem with that is that the evidence and the testimony that might prevent you from actually being revoked in Georgia is in Texas. So you're entitled to a preliminary probable cause hearing in the jurisdiction that's supervising you. Well, in, a, in an extradition, the scope of that examination is only basically your identity. You know, they're not examining whether there's probable cause. They're not examining what you did with the demanding state. The fugitive, you're a fugitive from justice. So they're examining, are you that fugitive? And has the demanding state perfected the paperwork? But they're not getting into a mini trial. Well, in a, in a retaking proceeding, they were actually getting into a preliminary hearing to establish probable cause. So that's why you don't want to waive extradition. You've already waived that when you when you transfer. You want your probable cause determination. And chance, I bet if you were to go out and ask your lawyer buddies, if you ask them to explain that, I bet you wouldn't find a one that'd be able to explain it. Well, not not too many. No, that's exactly. <laughs> <what I'm saying. laughs> so. Another issue, though, is the polygraph, the uh, Kabuki machine. And what did you tell him? I don't want to use the word advise, Larry, because you didn't advise. What did you suggest that he do on that subject? Well, he's very concerned about uncharged criminal conduct that he might disclose in the recent, uh, in the treatment polygraph. And I stress that even if they accuse him of deception, he cannot benefit from confirming their suspicions. I emphasize the truth will not set you free. And I asked him, I said, you're a trained interrogator. You interrogated many people in your career. When you finished your interrogation, after they came clean and, and told you what you wanted to know, did you put the handcuffs on or did the truth set them free? And he said that almost every time he put the handcuffs on, I said, well, what would have changed? I mean, well, they're going to do the same thing to you. But I'll let Chance, he's been working on this for hours and he can explain better what I'm trying to explain here, but the truth is not going to set you free. If you tell them you've engaged in uncharged conduct, you can expect bad things to happen. That That's that's completely true. I mean, the, the question of whether polygraphs are a good way to figure out whether someone is lying was settled long ago, and, and the answer is they aren't. There's no unique physiological sign of deception. There's no evidence whatsoever that the things that the polygraph measures, heart rate, blood pressure, sweating and breathing are linked to whether you're telling the truth or not. So, you know, why is law enforcement so bent on using them? One reason is, is because they're useful as a prop in the theater of interrogation. If the examiner does the theater well and tricks the subject into believing that their lies can be detected, they might confess. And this is what Larry's referring to. You know, I mean, just shake the tree and, you know, believe that you know, what's happening is actually happening, and voila. And related is the belief that polygraphs might be useful as a deterrent. If the registrant believes that they're going to be regularly subject, uh, subjected to accurate lie detection tests, committing a crime suddenly looks like a guarantee of heading back to prison. So for both these uses, it doesn't matter whether the test actually works, just that it's perceived as so. So here's the bottom line. You're not going to be convicted for a failed polygraph test, but you will certainly face legal consequences for admitting uncharged conduct. And that is my fear with this particular case, is that if he falls into that trap, which many people do fall into, it's so sweet at the end of a polygraph when the examiner tells you, you know, we're adults here, and I'm really, I don't have an axe to grind, I'm just here, you know, trying to help everybody involved and it seems like there's something you need to come clean and get it off your chest you know they have all these uh, things that they tell you and you trust this person and you think well maybe he's serious well he is serious <laughs> he's serious about getting that team of people that are working to lock you up to help them facilitate that if you admit anything you're going to go down and when you tell them that when he said, when the examiner says, well, 
I'm really troubled because you're showing a negative seven. So I'm really troubled also because I told you the truth. And I'm assuming that, that you told them the truth. But when they said, well, why is the machine saying that? Well, if I could explain why the machine is the way it is, I would be so rich I wouldn't be sitting here. I don't know why the machine does what it does. All I know is that the courts, they're not admissible in court. They're very limited in terms of how they're allowed to be used. And they're notoriously unreliable. That's all I know. But I can tell you the truth. Are you asking me to tell you a lie? Now, so, now suppose you threw in some extra stuff like what you found from the polygrapher that you spoke to. And and I know that it's only about as good as a coin flip. If you start throwing things at them, I bet you you end up having a very hostile polygrapher. Oh, if you started saying that to polygrapher, you would definitely have a hostile polygrapher. <laughs> and are they gonna are they gonna turn up the electrodes or something? They're the only thing they're gonna do if you fail a polygraph is they're gonna intensify your supervision because as chance stated, they I've never seen a petition to revoke that says subject probationer violated uh, a failed a polygraph examination. If anybody's got such a petition like that, please forward it to me because I'd like to see it. And so that's not going to be uh, a, a petition that's going to be filed, but the petition will be filed that says at the conclusion of an examination that subject pro probationer did in fact acknowledge these violations. And as these violations are clearly not acceptable, we're moving the court to terminate the supervision and, in, and impose a sentence of imprisonment. That's what will happen. And now there are times when people get terminated from treatment and that's a condition of their supervision and they get dropped from treatment because they're deemed deceptive. And that's an issue that I wish we could figure out how to challenge on a constitutional ground. If they won't t have you in treatment because in their opinion, you're lying, that seems like a backdoor way of using the polygraph to put a person in prison because you can't yeah, totally you can't be in treatment if they won't have you in treatment and the only thing you can do is make a paper trail offering to do alternative treatment and seeking suggestions but if they drop you from treatment chance what are you supposed to do if they say we won't treat you anymore you're lying you're not going to make any progress in in our program what are you supposed to do yeah that's a conundrum what what do you do you, you know <laughs> you litigate Hey, 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 Larry, so there was this guy in my treatment class, and as the uh, the treatment person was going around talking about, oh, it's time for your polygraph, there was, this, there was this older guy, he was roughly your age, and he was starting to have some memory issues, and that brings up a very interesting situation. If you don't remember whether you have violated your terms of probation because you are old as dirt and your memory is failing, well, then you're not lying. So they were going to give him alternate uh polygraph tests and using the uh the little um the little blood pressure cuff on your little uh doodad down below <laughs> i can't see any problem with that what was the problem with that <laughs> god he's trying to liven it up a little bit i guess oh jesus i was like you're gonna give the guy a plethysmograph i was just like how barbaric is this uh it was so bizarre it was so very bizarre and that's what I call getting jacked by the system. <sighs> God, not, not jacked enough. Oh, boy. Um, are we ready to move on from here? I think so. Okay, then we're going to, Larry, I, almost, I, I should have told you beforehand that we don't need to do this because I got uh, kind of chastised by one of our patrons about talking about elections have consequences because he's like, I don't want to hear that crap anymore because I know. And there's nothing I can do about it because I can't vote. Well, if he's one of those that truly can't vote, that's one thing. But a lot of people don't think they can vote, can actually vote. Oh, no. He's in Florida. He can't vote. Oh, in the freedom blood. I forgot. <laughs> All right. Kentucky governor cites higher incarceration costs in veto of criminal justice bill. What is this? Well, I didn't want to dwell on it, but I just wanted to point out that there are courageous elected officials. Uh, you have a governor from the Democrat Party in Kentucky and chose to exercise the veto, and there could be a showdown. But I'm not sure if Kentucky is on the same election cycle that we are where they're going to have a significant number of legislators up. There's a few states that have these oddball elections, uh, and, and they, they may be on that cycle where they, there's time for him to recover from this veto. But it was a veto. And I don't know if, if there is an override attempt, we'll report back on it. But uh, don't say that everybody is spineless because 
this as a, an elected official showing some courage. That's what I wanted to, to say about it. Do you think he can survive a veto, whatever you want to call it, where the Senate, the, the legislative body would go back and overturn the the um, the veto? Well, it would. There's a lot of political considerations I didn't do the research on, but if this is an election year, and like say for example, if the entire House of Representatives in Kentucky were to be up for a re-election, they would probably not vote to sustain the the governor. They would probably vote with the Republicans to override the governor. But if they're not facing election this year, that gives them some breathing room. So there's like the, the you know, depending on what offices are up for election is what's going to happen with this. I see. And then another article is Tennessee Senate advances bill to allow death penalty for child rape. Well, that's actually uh, a thing that's working its way around the country, particularly in conservative uh, governed states. Uh, and it's not about the death penalty per se, but it is. What they're trying to do is the Supreme Court through the years has has uh, imposed some limitations on the use of the death penalty. You know, juveniles, for example, people that are mentally, uh, have mental disorders at certain levels that can't be executed. And uh, I think an Idaho legislator was quoted as saying, we're deliberately wanting to pass this. We think it's unconstitutional, but we're going to pass it anyway because we want the death penalty for child rapists. We want it to get before the Supreme Court of the United States because they believe that the Supreme Court is it's per- currently constructed, composed of a lot of conservatives. They believe that they will get uh, a better outcome on the death penalty. And uh, the Supreme Court will say it's really up to the states. That's what they're hoping for. So this is a battle to expand the use and the state options of how they use it and impose the death penalty. In my opinion, what what say you, Mr. Chance? I I agree. I agree. That's what I say. So, and and then we're and then we're going to go to the California corner, skipping the homeless. Uh, Very good. Corner. I was just going to suggest that we do that. And and here we have the California corner with Chance Oberstein. What have you for us tonight? Well, just just a little little message, uh, you know about. How to protect yourself in an adverse society? Of course, we all we're all aware of that. But I think it's important because um, I'm seeing a lot of a lot of calls and a lot of concern over areas that people seem to want to you know turn away from rather than understand. So this is just a little note to take down in terms of what things you should know and how you should prepare yourself to live uh, in the uh, era we're living in. So first of all, I think number one, you have to understand the parameters of the registry as it relates to your conviction or convictions, okay, which leads you to registration, for example, in California. In California, registration requirements span over 12 separate statutes. Now, that's not, you know, every state's different, but it's pretty convoluted in California. How do you approach something like that? Well, one, I would say perceive registration as a mere record keeping requirement, just like you do taxes or anything else. Be professional. Project the attitude you expect to encounter when you go in and do it and say only what you need to say because brevity in terms of registration and the process is everything. Hey, hey, Chance. And that goes, uh, so, yeah. Wait, I, 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 have to, I have to interject because be professional. Uh, one of our patrons, the same one that can't vote in Florida, he sent me a picture. He was at the registration office, and there was a guy in there with a snake around his neck. Now, right. you you said be professional. Would having snake around your neck be considered professional attire? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Would not be professional. That's what Sorry, I'm saying. I just couldn't resist this is, that This one. is why I get calls all the time. I get calls about this. And I ask, you know, how did you show up? What did you wear? You know, so I wore a snake. You know, how did you? <laughs> yeah, no, no. Don't take your snake. Don't take your snake. Okay. Don't do that. And, and don't take children as a human shield. And there's a whole bunch of other things, but this is just a common outline, and we can we can fill this in later. And this also pertains to you know knowing about domestic travel. You know, in general, know about the state and federal rules international travel, 
Understand what the federal rules require. Know what law enforcement can and cannot do with respect to registration. And this is really important for Californians especially. Missions. What happens if you fail to include required information on your registration form? A lot of people come from other states and have dual residency because they want to get off, off registration in California. So it will help them in the state they've moved to. Okay, but they omit to put down certain things that the form requires. Make sure you understand what the form is asking. Make sure you include it in the form. Um, relocating, whether it's jurisdictionally, whether it's you know, in any other state or whatever. There are reporting requirements in California. you got five days to do that. Know what compliance checks, compliance checks entail. Now, California, you know, the law enforcement will show up at your door. They'll be able to be there legally, so understand that what they smell or what they see or what they hear comes to play as collateral, okay, collateral consequences of this compliance check. Make sure you live your living. And especially be aware of scams. Because people get scammed all the time. I'm a, I get calls. These hey, Chance, can we, uh, Chance. Huh? Say that. Uh, you're 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 breaking up really bad right now, and uh, so so Larry, for, while while Chance's internet settles, go over these compliance checks for a minute. You you expect me to be able to go over compliance <laughs> checks? <laughs> I can tell you that when they when they would do them for me, they would come in and like I do not drink. I just don't. Never have. There's no beer in my fridge. But man, sure as hell, they would always come in and they're like. Pfft. Check in the fridge and look for the bottle of Jack Daniels or look for the Budweiser. There's never alcohol in my house. But they come in and they would do it every freaking time. You know, but now you got to remember, you were under supervision. Correct. When it's happening. Well, now, compliance checks also happen to people who are not under any form of supervision. They can have all the alcohol they want in their refrigerator because there's no, there's no registration requirement that you're forbidden to drink alcohol. It is smell then referring to pot? That's Anything right. that would be unlawful. That's Anything that right. you would have unlawful in, in their presence so that they observe. But see, you don't have to let them in. Now, California being the communist state, they may have a rule that you have to let them in. But no, you don't no, have no. to let the you don't have to let the registration people come in unless you choose to. Right. And right. and Chance, what is this about beware of scams? Well, I just want to go back and 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 you know emphasize what Larry just said because there's no special rule in California that you are allowing somebody into your place. You just have to be aware of your environment, what you know can be seen through a window or what's happening at any given time. Now, being aware of scams, you should know the police can't keep you on the phone and demand money at an ATM machine. That's not the way things work. Okay, and there's a lot of different scams. But just be aware that they're out there and that you know you you are a target of those scams. And, you know, if you feel that you know, you, you're being pressured and someone's asking you to do something that you wouldn't otherwise have to do, understand it's, it's, it's just not a natural thing and it's just not a legal thing. It's probably a scam. And so bottom line is exercise good judgment. Um, the social and legal landscape, think about this. Your home, people who come into your home, make sure that you know what you're, what you're doing when you allow individuals to enter your home. Make sure you know who they are and that you can trust them. Regulated areas such as schools, can you drop your kids off? Can you pick them up? Know what the laws say. Know what you can and cannot do. And in terms of extracurricular activities, ask yourself, is it safe? Is it sane? Is it legal? If any answer to these are no, don't do it. Bottom line. Just, going just a little to, message. Sure. Going back to the uh, what you're allowed to do, so to speak. How there is there a compiled list somewhere that says I can do X, Y, N, Z, or not A, B, and C? Okay. In which way, Andy? Explain that. Well, um, because because there are fifty states plus territories, et cetera. You're saying that you said, I think, 12 different statutes tell you what the rules of your uh, registry rules are. And you have Correct. to go noodle through 12 different textbooks to figure out what you're allowed and not allowed to do. 
No, they're all on one. They're they're in Penal Code two ninety. Um, but you you know you should you should look through that if you're a Californian, and you should also understand, for instance, what you can do and what you couldn't do. If you change your name, you need to report that within five business days. Most people don't understand that in California. So it really behooves a person to look through and just get a general concept. And if they don't know and they're going to do something, maybe talk to a legal professional before they do it instead of doing it afterwards. And then, oh. uh, as we've all seen the, uh, oh God, what's the name of the movie? Untouchable? Is that the name of the movie with the guy from Florida, Ron Book? And there's the girl that they profiled in Oklahoma who was taking her daughter to the park and they were changing the law the next day. This was the last time she was going to be able to take her daughter to the park because they were changing it that PFRs can't be in parks now. Like, it's incredibly, incredibly hard for us to keep up with these things. And they make it, I don't know that they make it, they certainly don't make it easy for you to follow it. No, not easy, not at all. Complex, hard hard and very easy to get in trouble. Right. What were you going to say, Larry? Well, on the extracurricular activities, I would suggest people think it through. Uh, when you, there are things that you would be allowed to do that you probably shouldn't do and things that you should do just be, because it's a safe thing to do. If you have, if you're a victim with a hands-on child victim, and you go into a restroom, and you're the only one in the restroom other than a minor child, are you allowed to use the restroom? Of course you are. Is it a wise thing to do? Probably not, unless it's a dire emergency. You, you would exit the restroom. <laughs> I mean, that's just use a little bit of common sense and things that could go south on you that you ought not do. You know, the situation I was dealing with with that woman that we at the top of the program, now that she's making accusations, it's going to be hilarious if she makes one on me because I went to her house <laughs> to pick up the paperwork to reflect that she did have payments coming from Social Security Administration. And, and looking in the rearview mirror, maybe it wasn't such a wise idea for me to go to her house, but I was trying to go above and beyond because of the, and my heart felt bad for her. But just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. And think about it very carefully. How is this going to look if push comes to shove? Don't take it to a paranoid level that you're obsessing over it. But if you walk into a restroom and there's only a minor in there, get get the heck out of there. Larry, if if she makes allegations against you, I'm going to play the Clinton laugh on repeat. Oh, is that right? I'll just loop it. Now that would be funny. <laughs> um. Now I I we are talking about registration conditions correct chance we are not talking about supervision conditions right that, yeah that's correct did you get a that's chance correct. to look at that pdf i sent you sent you uh before i did did you look at 19 like i asked i did <laughs> no i, I realize that, that this is like a special condition of condition? probation well no the number chaperone. 19 well it says you will never drive alone especially and i'm like okay so you've already said never and now you've added especially on top of it. I never understood how I can never do something and then more never do it more. Never. Yeah, I think they're trying to, you know, trying to make sure uh, that, you, you know, that you don't enter areas where children are. And it sounds like a chaperone type thing, but you know, the language is so poorly done, it sounds like uh, you'll never drive alone. Right. <laughs> I, I, and you then know, like the probation officer calls and says, yeah. come to the office. You said I can't drive alone. Will you come down here and escort me up to the office, please? Yeah, that would, exactly. That would be that would be funny. Do that. <laughs> it, it just a, it was a it's a crazy condition because it's just so poorly written. You know, right. but yeah. Now, and Larry, are those are those conditions written by attorney and uh, not attorney uh, legislators or are those written by the uh, the Department of Corrections kind of people? The probation it's the, people. It's the bureaucracy that put uh, composes all those rules. The the day to day operations are well beyond the scope of legislative oversight, and even the governor's office isn't paying any attention to that. I mean, they they put a corrections secretary in, and the corrections uh, team is assembled that's going to supervise the department. The various actually, the way ours is constructed, we have the Department of Corrections, and then within the Department of Corrections, you have divisions. You have the division. Of probation and parole. You have the adult 
prisons division. So you have the interstate compact, all of these different divisions, and those things are being supervised. Um, uh, nobody's at the legislative level would even think about that. It's like, we're not interested in that. It's too, too mundane. I appreciate all this, Chance. It's uh, high, highly useful. Um, Chance, I realize that you are licensed in the communist state of California. Correct. If someone called you from one of these uh, freedom-loving states and they had questions, would you be in a position to help them navigate it? Or I'd are certainly... they just so crazy that you can't transfer the knowledge from state to state? If, if it's a generic question, sure. I mean, you know, if it's if it's if, and if it's a state specific one, that's a little bit different. But at least navigate them to a place where they could understand what exactly what, what they need to do or where they need to go in order to get that answer. Because you know, as the attorney that is uh, representing FYP education and all that, we need you to be the master attorney of the universe. All righty then. Okay. <laughs> Is there anything else that we need to cover before we shut this thing down, Larry? We're already on overtime. I don't think we just we just crossed an hour just now. Um, we did get a new patron. Pam joined. It was nine days ago, Larry, and we were uh, on a slight bit of hiatus. And I was driving all over the place, man. It was it was a lot of driving. Um, and anyway, Pam, welcome. Larry, did we get any snail mail subscribers? Uh, no new subscribers, but we do want to offer our heartfelt. Warm thank you to Mark for his generous donation to support the transcript service. He's a recipient of the transcript, and he had a windfall come to him, and he wanted to share some of the windfall, and that was just so uh, kind and generous. Thank you, Mark. Was it one of those, uh, um, um, what should I do, stimulus checks? It wasn't quite that big, but it was amazing for a person who's incarcerated. Wow. He must be, he must be uh, suitcasing cell phones. Okay, on that, I guess we will shut it down and uh, head over to registrymatters.co for the show notes. And you can leave voicemail at 747-227-4477. We've received a lot of email lately, and that's at registrymatterscast at gmail.com. And, of course, as I was saying earlier, head over to patreon.com slash registrymatters. And just for as little as a buck a month, uh, you can support the program, and it's very much appreciated. And I, that's all I've got. Thank you, everyone, the hundreds of people that showed up in chat tonight and listened to us record this live. I greatly appreciate it. It was a good time. Keeping things lively while the show is going on. I don't have anything else. Have a good evening, Chance and Larry, and I will talk to you all soon. Thank you. Good night. Good night. You've been listening to FYP.